Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the Nightmare Cabin. This is the uh, first of an ongoing series. Me and my good friend Luke, you may remember from the uh, guesting on the Gully and Joe show. Um, we've decided, well, we've wanted to a long time, I've wanted to for a long time anyway, do um, all the Iron Maiden albums, but the uh, nature of the metal show with Gully and Joe was, it was to enable to do all of the albums. It was just, I couldn't see how we was ever going to do it. It took us like two years to do the first eight Abbott albums and the eight or seven Death albums. So I wanted to do a separate show where we just concentrated on one a week, boom, 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 separately. So it's its own little thing. And me and Luke have known each other a long time. Luke's known me since I was a grasshopper. I, uh, I don't think you quite got me into Maiden, but I just started to, and then you kind of just pushed me along. Yeah, I think I think I played that role in uh, in loads of people's lives. I was like the like the metal granddad <laughs> to a to a lot of you. So um, yeah, this is a a new series that we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to do one one album a week we're going to be going through all the nooks and crannies as well the solo albums the side bands and when we get there we'll get there and then that'll be it we'll um we'll just close the book so we're starting this week with the first the self-titled debut album um before we get started i just want to touch just touch a little bit on the uh soundhouse tapes um doing a bit of reading over the uh last couple of days i've been the official biography uh this is a pretty cool book actually this is the um iron maiden 80 to 81 by uh greg prato prato even prato <laughs> and um, it just it just covers the uh paul diano years and i've got a couple of other book series which i'll go through as the series goes as we go on i'm not going to sit and show everything um it's funny, just as much detail is on this recording as there is on some of the albums, I've noticed. Um, what's your take on the Soundhouse tapes now? Uh, you know, I've, I think I've only ever heard it twice. I've never I've never sought out a copy, even, even at the height of me collecting picture discs and all that shit. It was, it was, is there, what, where's a legit copy? So I never, I never really bothered and I'm very much a guy who probably a bit of a fucking snobby elitist thing to say, really, but I'm not a fan of production from that era. It it winds me up how poorly produced some of these albums are, and I know it's unfair to compare them to now, so I never really sought it out. I, I sought it out to say, right, yeah, I've heard it, but they're very raw and not for my ears. You know, I much prefer the later, you know, the versions on this album and obviously the live versions as well because they came into their own because they were done it was poor, poorly produced but i suppose it's a product of its time really yeah i mean it is a demo at the end of the day yeah um you think uh it's the primitive versions of those songs i think it's quite raw quite energetic it's quite nice to have as a collect as a collection piece or a completion piece really but um no more no less i wouldn't have um, spent stupid amounts of money um i think you, you i've had a look on ebay and you see these um some of them have like a certificate of authentication saying it's like it's one of the original i think they even made like a couple of thousands and it was only for um five thousand and it was only they were it was only mail order wasn't their, it yeah it was yeah so yeah and all that certificate of authenticity that's bollocks just not worth the fucking paper it's printed on yeah probably yeah you're right there so um yeah, 1980, the um, greatest year of ever, ever in heavy metal, according to some. You yeah. want to go through it? You've got the first Maiden album, first Angel Witch album. You had two British albums Steel. from Saxon. You had Priest, uh, British, British Steel, Steel yeah. yeah. Heaven and Hell by Sabbath. Um, mm. Blizzard of Oz by Ozzy. Ace of Spades, Motorhead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, come on. <laughs> I think that's pretty much about it. Yeah, you've, oh, yeah, AC/DC, I mean, back in black. Yeah, back in black, yeah. I'm sure the Scorpions must have released something. 
Possibly, yeah. All, I'm, the, main, I'm, all the main stage, weren't they? You know, so. Yeah. I um, I got a funny story as well. Actually, before we come up, I'll come on. I'll, I'll put my um, Dance of Death T-shirt on. Right on the Dance of Death tour, and I got that in extra large because they didn't have any other sizes on the night. That was a concert we went to. That was the first time I ever saw them live, by the way. And because um, it was that. Excel, it was massive on me at the time. So I got my mum to sort of cut it up and sew it again so it fit <laughs> like a medium. Well, I'll just put it on now. And I was like a heavy metal Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and turn it, taking it off, I, it was like rigs in Lethal Weapon 2. It was like, <laughs> hold my shoulder out, yeah, yeah. getting it over. <laughs> So this was produced by, um, I've got the uh, thing here. Do you remember who this was? Uh, Will Malone. Yeah. and um, Whoever the fuck he was. Yeah. And he, he not, doesn't not come Martin, across. Yeah. Not Martin Birch, who, who as a he, side note, they wanted, but didn't think he touched them because he was a legend. And apparently he'd heard the demos and gone, I'd fucking love to produce this band. And it won him almost never happened sort of thing. Yeah, he uh, he sort of says, oh, the band said to me, did you work with Black Sabbath? And I said, yeah, but it turned out he did a bit of tracking on one Sabbath song, um, Sabra Cadabra. And he was like, and they took it as I produced the album, but I didn't, and I didn't. It's like, oh, bollocks, you blatantly blagged it. <laughs> of course he did, yeah. Um, Hottish young band at the time, and you thought, yeah, I'll have some of this. Yeah. I've got to admit, I don't, I've not too... I don't really... I'm not too fussed about the production, to be honest. I think the album sounds okay. Yes, there was a leap ahead on the second album, but that's pretty much you can say that about any band, really. That's what should happen, you know. Yeah, um, I think. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I think the. Uh, I'm in the Steve Harris camp. I, I'm not a fan of the sound whatsoever. I mean, it sounds the way it sounds. And it's iconic because it sounds that way. But you know, it, it, the songs deserve better. Yeah, and, and it, I, it, and it sort of mars across, it for me. They do come across a lot better live. So. Yeah. Um, no, right, let's get. It is one of them things, you know. It's would would they ever go back and redo it? You know, like re. It's one of them things that you know that they're, they're, they're in a sort of position in their careers where they could do that if they wanted. But whether they do it or not, I don't know. Well, they kind of have, haven't they? Because they did record well, they a did, bunch of songs. They did Charlotte the Arla and um, Prowler on a B-side of one of the Seven Sun singles. I think it was kind of Play of Madness. They did them with Bruce and obviously Nico and Adrian. So it was only mm. Steve and Dave who had originally played on them. And they sounded all right because it wasn't the originals. It was, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. You, you get a better production and you'll get current members doing it, but it's not the original, which is the one you fall in love with. Yeah, I mean, I I have nothing against when a band sort of revisits an album. I, I've, I've had this argument a few times with various people. Um, I really like Anthrax's um, oh, Tale of Two Evils. Evils. Yeah, I quite yeah. like um, Exodus's... Uh, it's not Blood In, Blood Out. That's the new album. What's it called? Yeah, um, oh, I can't feel what it's called, but I know when I re-recorded... The, the re-recording uh, of uh, Bonded by Blood, yeah. yeah. And, um, Testament, Testament did it, didn't they? With yeah, I, um, I just see it as them revisiting the songs. They, yeah. They're just, yeah, they're coming well, full first circle. Strike, deadly, that's it. Yeah, that was uh, best of of the first two albums, wasn't it? Yeah. I just see it as a compa- I see it as a companion piece to the original album. I don't. Yeah, see- it's, it's it's the same with with remakes of films. You know, the, you're going to be in the camp. You're going to have people who will be like, yeah, you know, it doesn't bother me, or people are going to hate it on principle. You know, and it's like like I'm I'm with you. It's like it doesn't take away from what's there. Sometimes they sound better, sometimes they sound worse, but they're never going to take away from the fact you've got that original to, to fall back on. So Exactly. I mean, maybe a remix or a re... But then again, it's just... I don't think it's going to please anyone at this point. I think it is what it is. And yeah. Even that. So let's get into know, the when, tracks. When they eventually uh, call it a day, Steve Harris might go, you know what? Fuck it. Let's, uh, he's, got some, he's got some tricks up his sleeve, I think, for retirement. Um, I remember when the early days... DVD came out, and he the uh, there was an article for it, and you know you have your your big quote in the middle. Yeah, yeah. He went, I've got enough material to do a DVD for each album, like a documentary on the making of, and uh, that would be that would be my wet dream for me. And he, he went, but that's taking the piss a bit, isn't it? <laughs> oh, <fuck laughs> and it. you could just hear Steve Harris going, "That's taking the piss a bit, isn't it?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> could do, but I don't think I will. But, um, have you got your uh, 
your relic, your original copy of the. Uh... I have. I don't know where it's going to show up because I've got the background on, but it is I'm probably running fucking sharp at all. Uh, look at that. Yeah, look fucked. <laughs> but it's basically it is the first pressing of the album my dad bought it when it came out it's that's actually, one thing i forgot to mention actually i did i forgot to talk about how you got tell us how you got yeah into the band. i'll do that yeah i mean that's a nice segue because this album is is actually it's by fame recordings distributed by emi so that shows how fucking old that is and recently signed by paul diano when we met him at um car and horses and then um, but now i mean me for maiden Fucking hell, I mean, I'm, I'm 41 and I've been into them since I was three. Number of the Beast, like one of my earliest memories is my dad playing the record and me on the set with a pen as a microphone singing Run to the Hills. And I was three years old and that's when he sort of taught me how to load up the old vinyl on the record player so I wouldn't scratch the fuck out of it. And that's when I fell in love with metal. But it was always made because even at three years old, looking at them album covers, mate, it was, uh, it was like, what is this? And it was awesome. I know it's what everyone's tale is getting into Maiden is they saw Eddie and fell in love. And yeah. I'm no different. You know, it was a, it, it was just a mind blow, especially when you're three years old. I mean, fucking hell. But, but no, good times, mate. And it was a good ideal way for me to go. I just, it was just Maiden forever on there. You, um, have you got the other albums as well? Or no, have you um, got that one? Yeah, well, I've got, got, your number got, of beasts to, um, got up to Seventh Son on vinyl, all the original first pressings. Um, and then after that, it, it, no prayer and fear of the dark didn't happen because Dad died the same year fear of the dark came out. But I, that would have been on CD, wouldn't it? At that, at that point, yeah. I mean, that was my that was my first actual first piece of music I ever bought was fear of the dark, and it was on CD. But I have got the ultra rare album version of Best of the Beast with a booklet and the list of all the gigs and all that. And that was the last one I got from Maven because I I sort of fell out of love with collecting. Then it was just a case of I ain't got the room. Let's just go for MP3s. They take up less room, so just people can swear at me for that if they want. But you know, yeah, I mean, I've got the, uh, I've, I've got to go back there somewhere in the library. <laughs> but um, yeah. I've got all these new editions here. But yeah, all the rest is at the back there, and I can't be bothered to get up. I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll get mine out when uh, we come to that part of the catalogue. I think. But um, right, first off. Are we? I've got two copies here. I've got the uh, original, well, not the original, but the first reissues, really, uh, with the revamped, slightly oh, yeah. revamped artwork with the eyes. Enhanced CD shit with it. Yeah, you've got your stuff. Yeah. Think, booklets in this are really good, actually. Shit, those are photos, and you've got a bit of a um, sort of bullet point thing on the events. So, like, with release dates, a rundown of the tours. So, they went on tour with. they. Were the first live band since the Who to go on top of the Pops. Um, 19 date tour supporting Judas Priest on the British Steel tour. Uh, did a headline tour, uh, 51 dates. Uh, then the album's released. Uh, where is it as well? They do a they do the Reading Festival, special guests to UFO, and then they do a European tour opening for Kiss. Now I always thought that. Um, that was an American tour, but I'm wrong. That's the thing as well. I was just reading that book. I was, I, I can't remember. I read an, I swear I read an article somewhere. I've just gone off on mine. Sorry. Let me get back to where <laughs> I was. Um, yeah. So we've got this one and I've got this now new, which came out last year. They did four albums every couple of months. You got the little action figure with one of them. That's the original back cover, which I much prefer. I think that's such a cool photo yeah, of the band what's, what's the other back cover then oh, um, I haven't seen uh, those. just a photo oh, of no, the band no, no 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 the live the live set yeah. this one on back of the final so but this one's got the extra track so i didn't know if you wanted to include because this is um eight tracks this is nine and this yeah, is sanctuary is yeah. the second song now i thought the whole point of this was they did it with killers they added a track they had it also yeah, added game like total eclipse to um number of base, number yeah. of base. And I thought the only reason those album songs were cut was because of they couldn't fit them on an LP. So this was a way of correcting that. Yeah. These songs are now part of the canon, yeah. of the al album canon at least. But then these come out and it's back to normal. Back to normal. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know really how that weighs up. So I don't know if you wanted to include... I'm happy yeah, to... We can, yeah, we can do Sanctuary. I mean, it's, you know... 
Because I think there's a bit of a small debate. Um, basically, the flow of the album. I think, I would think it though, because I heard this one first, because I worked my way back. But um, I think it flows better with Sanctuary. But we'll get into that. But yeah, just wanted to quickly add in. Um, I could have sworn I saw an article, and I can't find it anywhere, but Angel Witch had a showcase gig for record labels. So again, I don't know where I've imagined this. I'm not saying it's totally accurate or totally true, but for some reason I had this in my head, that they had a showcase gig. Uh, the singer-guitarist from Angel Witch, whose name escapes me, I'm afraid, um, Kevin something, had a few drinks to loosen up and sort of calm his nerves, had a few too many, bowled up the gig a bit, played a bit loose, and um, the nerves got the better of him, and the show kind of fell on its ass a little bit. But, and all the record labels basically snapped up the support band instead, and that support band was Iron Maiden. Now, I just had a quick read through of that thing today, and no, the, um, they sold out the marquee, bought a backdrop, especially for the show, so they made themselves look as professional and, you know, Rather than just a club band, that was like, yeah. oh, this is a, a proper show that we're putting on, and they really went out with the fireworks and the lights and the eddies, and the, you know, they really went to town, knowing that the um, record labels were going to be there. Plus, selling it out was handy, and um, the record labels basically couldn't get in. <laughs> they, oh, they yeah, were stuck outside. Yeah, I'm, I'm outrageous, story, yeah. But they finally did get in. It's like, I could hardly could, see the fucking stage. Yeah, they were after a show anyway. Yeah, he said, and for went, the well, crowd, this for itself. We'll yeah. just take them on. Yeah, that's so, the 12 wasted years. Uh, the 12 wasted yeah, years doctrine. I, I don't know where I read that about Angel Witch. Uh, I, I, that must be bollocks because that was never, well, mind you, not that they're going to mention it in any of their official. So official where the fuck did I read it? <sighs> Could be any. It, it, it's got to be something to it, isn't it? Cause... Unless, it was in, unless it was in Run to the Hills. Because that was a walk to know at the time. Yeah. I don't know where I imagine that. But um, anyway, so let's get into it. Prowler. Yeah. Talk to me. Uh, it's an iconic song. It's one of my favourite Maiden songs. And it, it's a fucking brilliant way to start an album. And for my years, anyway, it's unlike anything that had come before it. You know, uh, all this bollocks about Maiden were this ultimate metal punk fusion that's bollocks there's no punk in them whatsoever you know I, I hate that comparison as much as steve harris does but i mean as far as the song goes it is it's, it, it's so good and i wish they'd play it live more often um i always imagined that the song title was a metaphor for the band sort of prowling the old guard and ready to pounce to fucking take them down and announce they were there sort of thing almost like you know a flash of jumping out the bushes you know, just saying, right, we're here, deal with it, we're not going anywhere. And I think it's a, I don't know, I, mean, I might be reading too much into it, but to me, that's how it is. They're like, we're here, and they're sounding so fresh. It, it was, it's an awesome song. Yeah, I think it's quite a um, unique song for Iron Maiden as well, because they never really did anything like it again. No, no, it, like, yeah, he's yeah, he's very he is unique, yeah. Um, I've, I've, I'm going to... I'm going to argue a little bit with a punk thing because I think they did have a punk edge, mainly, excuse me, down to Paul Giano. Yeah, yeah, I've I've, um, I've read that argument and yeah, I can see, I can see the merits of it, but not let, yeah, let me yeah, yeah. Um, make my case a bit further. I think um, if you look at the other N W O H M, is that it? No, BHM, yeah. And <laughs> I always have to spell it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think they were still quite stuck in sort of the glam rock a little bit. If you take like the Def Leppard demos, the early Angel Witch stuff, um, there was still that kind of raw edge to Maiden. And there was something a bit more dangerous to Maiden than there were a couple a, a of other bands of that time. Yeah. And um, I think as well, I think if you take the first Iron Maiden album, if you say you have punk and then you have fresh, so say the first Metallica album. Yeah. Worlds apart, but I think Shane Maiden, Iron Maiden is that joins, bridge. Is the, yeah. And I think they are a bridge between punk and say heavy metal in the 70s style Sabbath and Priest. You know, so I, I think it's just that 
Uh, I think it's just referring to that raw edge rather than the snotty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, Ace of Spades is more of a more of a, a better comparison for the the punk metal mold because they were yeah they played yeah, hundred miles an hour for that album. You know, fucking the, the three of them. It was it was balls to the wall. So that's I think that's more of a a, a comparison for the punk metal mold. The Maiden. I think Maiden were totally unique, and it's a case of when you're when you're unique, no one knows how to label you, so they just fucking they lump you with anything. Yeah. For me. So um. Yeah, that opening thing, that and it was. It's just a classic rock song as well, because again, I am Maiden would talk about, you know, literature and books and history and like, these big epic story tales. And this was just like, it, it, the, the first verse and chorus anyway, it's kind of just Saturday night, walking yeah. through the city, looking pretty, yeah. Yeah. going to find my way. You know, you, yeah. you're a, a young kid finding his way in the world, doesn't know who he is yet. He just wants to go out, you know, see the ladies flashing all the legs and lashing. He's turning up at the pub or a club yeah. and the girls are done up. You know, you'd imagine the... Um, sort of leather skirt, fishnet, stockings, leather jacket, heavy metal girl, you know. Um, and then it kind of switches to, yeah, see me prowling through the bushes. It's like, oh, I thought this was about yeah. like a rocker on a Saturday. That's yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that, that brilliant breakdown. So you've got like a quick verse and chorus in there. And it just goes into that jam. Yeah. And um, there's so much, this is what's so good about this they kind of get this thing that they they went all prog later on but they're, they're just as progressive on this album yeah, sure. as they are. i mean aris has loved jeffro toll from the start hasn't he? you know it ain't, it ain't just all of a sudden discovered them since kevin shirley started producing them it's always been there yeah yeah exactly and there's like there's many songs within the songs as well which again we'll cover as we go me personally i mean i'm Moving on to Sanctuary, again, I think this is where the, this feels like a punk song to me. The It's just got a, well, I suppose it's got a, kind of like a status quo kind of head nodding. Yeah, bit, yeah I imagine if you, yeah, yeah, if you sort of slowed it down a bit and took it down to the riff to its basics, then yeah, it is. So you, you've contradicted yourself there because you talk about punk, you talk about status quo. Yeah, quiet. yeah, <laughs> I've just, the more yeah, I'm thinking right, about uh, it. Oh. I think, I don't know, maybe it's the guitar tone, I don't know, I, I just, I, I just feel a little bit of a punk, it's in the mix, you know, it's in the, there's a sprinkling of it in the, yeah. of that certain spice and in think, the gate And I think that's probably why that Steve and Paul never were going to make good bedfellows for long, because it was, the, Paul was trying to pull them one way and obviously Steve was like, no bollocks, I'm not having it. Um... Yeah, Sanctuary, I think, is another good, you know, classic rock song. It's a good, it's a song that puts me in a good mood when I hear it as well. Um, when the band do pull it out of the hat now and then, I mean, last time I believe they did, it was um, at the end of Rock and Rio, really. Yeah, it's been a while. They must have played it since, but, then, but it has been a while. I've seen them with the Bruce. Line. Yeah, I've, I've seen them opening with that track before, though, sort of on the um, Peace of Mind tour. There's yeah. one on the uh, early days DVD. There's a, it's not a full set, mind, but yeah, yeah that's so the one. Yeah, it's in Germany or something, isn't it, I think. Yeah, but again, I think a good one-two punch and then going into Remember Tomorrow. So you've got rock song, rock song. Now we've got a slow melodic yeah. song. Yeah, I can see um, that. Rather than Prowler straight into yeah, Remember you, Tomorrow. Because it's kind of like rock, go rock. From- yeah, I can see why it works better. Yeah, and there you go. Here's something different. But for them to go, oh, here's something different, second song no, in, wait. kind of feels a little disjointed to me. Yeah, especially when they've included, um, oh, we're going to come to it later, but when they included Strain- uh, fucking Strange World on there, you know, it's, that it, I think if they wanted to t- keep to the eight tracks, they should have dumped Strange World and then and put Sanctuary. and I think it was, it was one too many yeah possibly I mean 
I, I wouldn't. I, I see what you mean, but I, I wouldn't myself. But yeah, I could see maybe keep Sanch if you, if one had to go, then yeah, possibly. And time has borne that out because when's the last time they played Strange World? Never. Or no, when Bruce and, was um, a fucking band or whatever. You know when Bruce was, when they were touring Italy we've or kind whatever of, it was. Yeah, when we've we've skipped ahead, I think a little bit, but yeah, yeah. Strange World is the only song that Bruce Dickinson's never sung. There you go. It tells you tells the story. Feel free in the comments to tell me when I'm wrong, but as, to my knowledge, Strange World's never been done with Bruce. Everything else on the album has been either played live or re-recorded at some point. But yeah, remember tomorrow. What are your thoughts? Oh, that's that's another one, another fucking great song. But um, funnily enough. Uh, Maiden don't do the best version of it. For my ears, the best version is on uh, when Diano formed Killers and they re-recorded it on their debut, Murder One. Yeah. And they had obviously much better production, which helps it immensely because you need to hear those intricacies. But also what the guitarists did, whereas, whereas Murray and Stratton, they played a sort of a continuous picking and sort of following Steve Harris's bass line. The guitarists in Killers let the bass line carry the song totally and just use effects and fade in and fade outs, and it sounds much better. If if you want to check it out, do it. It's Killer's version of tomorrow night. For my ears, it is the the definitive version of the song. Even better than Made and Play It Live. It's such a good version. It, it's my if I listen to Remember Tomorrow, I go for that version. I don't go for Made version ever. Yeah, but the song um, is the song is great, and I, I used to cover it in the in the classic rock covers band I do, and it's so great to play live as well. It, it's a fucking awesome song. Yeah, it's and, a, and, it's, it, and it's something totally different again. Sorry, Joe, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's Steve Harris saying, right, we're not what came before. We are so totally different because, you know, songs like that didn't exist in 1980. You know, Sabbath may have played around with stuff like that, but until Harris came along and merged his prog loving with his love of, you know, hard rock, UFO and all that, stuff like this was unheard of. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a beautiful song. Um, it's it, uh, even I, I even remember the first time I heard it. The first time I heard that song was actually uh, the the video I had of um, live at the Rainbow Theatre, and um, yeah. even then, that first time it, I heard it, I like, saw it. Even I remember thinking, "Wow, this is different." Like it, it, there's there's the, the great thing about Maiden, especially when you're getting into them, is just you, you're constantly surprised. Going, there's more to this band, and that's what. It just hooks you. you. They, you, a greatest hits or something like that is a little taster, a little sweetener. But the more you go in, the more deeper you get. And I do. I think my the version on the Rainbow Theatre um, video is actually my favourite version of it, um, where the uh, song kicks in with a dam ba bam 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 da dan dan, and then um, Dennis gives it that scream with the guitar that yeah, yeah. Paul Diano screams along with that. And it just sounds fucking awesome. Um, it's say, just got this... Rainbow, had, um, I think that was that had Smith on it. Video. It had what? Sorry. I think it had Adrian Smith on it. Stratton went on that. Yeah, I'm talking about the Adrian studio. Song, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's right, though. Yeah, that's the thing as well. Was I thought that was record? Was that recorded with them supporting Priest as well? Because they supported Priest before the first that just before the first album came out. Yeah, it was obviously after because that's when that little mini feud bag kicked off, wasn't it? When um, someone said that we're going to blow the bollocks off Priest and KK down and got a fucking got the ump about it. He still <laughs> talks about it now, along along with fucking other shit that happened forty years ago. Yeah. What what what? No, we're not, we're not going to be nowhere near as good as them. You know, it's <laughs> like what what the fuck? Of course they're going to yeah. say that. You know that, exactly. Of course they are. I remember um, I was watching a. Do you remember the Joe Wiley show? Digressing again, but Lemmy was on that once, and um, there was a guy from a band called Embrace. Did you remember them? Indie band, and oh, no, she no, sort no, went, no. You, you got in hot water recently because you said you were better than Oasis. And he went, Well, yeah, like, well, he went, Well, I got told, I got asked in an interview, Do you think you're better than Oasis? And I said, Well, they do what they do, and we do what we do. I think we offer something different, and you know, and then Lemmy just chipped in and went, What was he meant to say? No. <laughs> yeah. Lemmy being Lemmy, yeah, you know. Yeah, and uh, right, uh, no, I think... yeah, I mean, you got to have you got to have belief in your own shit. Otherwise, what's the yeah, thing? yeah, no, no, we're nowhere near as good as them. Yeah, yeah, buy their album instead. Fuck it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's it, isn't it? But, um, no, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. but no, remember tomorrow's a 
fantastic song. It kind of, I kind when I listen to it, I still get this sort of vision of like either a sunset or a sunrise, but that yeah. is the bl- like a blue sky while it's still dark and it's just a peaceful, just a song that you can just sort of stare and go off yeah. on one a little bit. Yeah, it's but, um, great, great use of dynamics and probably one of Paul Yano's best maiden vocals, I think. Absolutely, yeah, totally agree. So, uh, yeah, moving on to uh, Running Free. Um, I My personal thing with Running Free, I, I, it's a great song. It, it, again, it's one of those songs I'm... I'm it, I'm, const- I'm automatically in a good mode as soon as I hear it. Um, but it's a very simple structure. Um, I, in this book I'm reading today, uh, Paul Diano said he, it, it was pretty much him that came up to it. He had the idea and then Steve kind of built the dun, 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 all around it. So I think he yeah, came up with a folk like melody. Yeah. <laughs> but he did. He said he basically based it on um, Gary Glitter's Rock and Roll. So that dun, 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 you know, yeah, it's like the drum, the drum beat to begin with. But um, Jeff Walters from Annihilator sort of chips in something I was kind of thinking, and then when he said it, it was like, yeah, I, someone agrees with me. Was um, he says you have songs where you really think about, and you really are like, these are the songs that we are. Like, this is what we are capable of. This is our, you know, yeah. offering to the world sort of thing. He says, and then you have songs that are just jam songs. Some songs are just fun to play and they're simple and you just kind of jam them out just to fill some time. It went, but funny enough, those songs always seem to be the ones that go down the web, down the best live. And I think Running Free was one of those songs. It was probably one of the songs that they spent the least time on, but with the, dun, 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 bum, 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 dun, 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 you know, the build up and the real sort of easy chorus, really. Um, you know, da da, I'm running free, and then you know, you, you, yeah, they they make it fucking drag out about fifteen minutes sometimes with the crowd yeah, participation, they do, they do the and intro- introductions and all that. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of those songs that's uh, it just works really well. It works sort of, it's a it's a live song, and it's for the gig. It's not the best written song. It's not the best you know track for them studio wise. It's, yeah, again, it's, it's as simple as it comes, especially like if it's the fourth track on the album so far, say. But, yeah, I think you know where I'm going with this, so yeah. I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, no, I mean, it's again, it's one of my favourite Maiden songs. I, it's, I love playing it, being a drummer. It's a great, great beat to play. Clive Burr excelled himself on this one. But um, it is, you can tell Steve Harris, this is not a rip-off, but a uh, homage, as Spinal Tap would say, to uh, Laid Our Love by Golden Eerie, which was obviously Steve's favourite band. If you play that song, it's Laid Our Love's got a, a, an intro, but then after about 25 <laughs> seconds, <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's it mate, it's like fucking Steve had his, had his Golden Earring head on when he wrote that. It's like he's trying to pay tribute to his heroes. Yeah. But, you know, um, but it is, it's a great song. It's a great song. And it's a much better, it's the ultimate, for me, it's the ultimate maiden set closer because it's full of balls. Like recently on Legacy of Beast Tour, they ended on Run to the Eels and it's such a, it's such an energy killer. You know, you've got your fire up from Hallowed and all the rest of it and then it comes in with Run to the Hills with this crap drum beat and it just kills it. But if they'd have gone straight into running free, it's an up-tempo beat and it carries the energy and it's a great way to end because you've got crowd sing-alongs and everything and it's a testament that 40 years later, you know, it's still one of their best songs for, for yeah. my ears anyway. I mean, so, like say, so, so simple, but so fucking good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and just, you can just, you know, I'm running free, yeah, ba I'm running yeah. free. Exactly. Yeah, this side. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you, there you, and then, and then just one, that last chorus where everyone's going. Yeah, That's yeah it's fucking phenomenal. So, right, um, Phantom of the Opera. Do we need to say any more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just one of them, you know. I want that on the song, gravestone. The only song we have advertised Luke Save, mate. Oh, uh, David Thompson drinking it. I don't know if you ever saw that advert. I've never saw it. I've, I've, I've read it. It's yeah. been referenced in a load of different magazines. And it, yeah, yeah I've, 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 I've seen it. I've never seen it. I'm sure it's on YouTube on somewhere. Block. It is. He's on the starting blocks, and I think he's drinking Lucas Aid, and you've got fucking Phantom of the Opera in the background. It's hilarious. 
these things that you never think you'd see or hear in the same sort of thing and like David Thompson and I made in this quality. But I suppose it's a testament to that song as well that it sounds so different that someone thought, fuck no, I want this. It's People are going to, when they hear this, they're going to go, what is this? And make them pay attention. Maybe because there's it's nothing like it before. And it's the first of the, the, the first entry into the uh, Steve Harris Seven Minute Club. That was his favourite. He always used to write these seven minute songs for some reason. It was weird. But, um, you know, it's, it's classic. Not like, much like most of the album, to be fair. Yeah, I think this is one of the, you know, I think this is one of the hints of what, what is to come. Yeah. I think they, 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 we're a long way from what my Maiden would become. Um, but this is one of the our songs that sort of hints of where yeah. the band are going. Um, it's, yeah, it's one of the, uh, there isn't a bad note on this album as far as I'm concerned. So, but yeah, again, you've got the, what I mentioned earlier, you've got the, the mini songs within the song. There's so many changes on there. Yeah, all the parts and all that. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And yeah. I'm I'm, I'm quite sure that I mean I'm I'm not the I'm not the biggest Sabbath fan as you know, but I'm quite sure that Sabbath did seven, eight minute songs long before Maiden did, but did they have the fucking changes and the and the mix of different things that Maiden were putting into seven minutes? Do you know what? Funny enough, um We've just done the, the the original Sabbath anyway, the first eight albums um, on the uh, Gully and Joe show, and um, you'll be surprised how short those albums are. Like those episodes, we just flew through them. Yeah. Like th- there's interludes on there as well. It's like fucking, there's only like five songs on this. You know, <laughs> like, one thing with Zeppelin, they never did a double album, never did a concept album. They, they they were quite straight down the line actually. You you didn't get a lot of um, Sabbath. Yeah, they they never re- the last two albums with Ozzy anyway. Um, Technical Etsy and Never Say Die got a bit weird, but um, apart from that, no, they, they didn't really do the um, they never really did the overblown thing. It was just they just knocked it out and that was yeah. that. But um, that's, that's that's the love of Jeff Rotar on it, I suppose. Yeah, did you know Tony Iommi left Sabbath and joined Zero Total for a bit? Um, I'm sure I read that somewhere recently yeah, the, as uh, well. They were basically an amateur band, and Jeff Rotol yes. picked him up, and obviously, oh, so I go where the money is, sort of thing. And yes, yeah, I, I think I read this on. on he was in them for about six or weeks something. or something. It, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Great Rock and Roll Circus, is it? Do you remember the Rolling Stones sort of concert yeah. stroke film? They, he was on that with Jeff Toll. But yeah, he, he just didn't really like the fact that he was just like a employee really. Yeah. Um so um he went, no, I'm gonna do my own thing and went back to Sabbath where he formed them a few weeks later. What yeah. a bad move. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and the rest is history. So um next up, one of my favourite instrumentals of all time, Transylvania. Yeah. It fits perfectly with um Phantom of the Opera as well. Um, Paul Diano's favourite song because it gives him a chance to have a fag. Uh, <laughs> that was his input in one of these. <laughs> um, I, I, I I miss the instrumental. I think it's something that's... I think it's great to put in the middle of an album. I think it's a great thing to see live as well. Yes, they can be self-indulgent. Yes, they can be boring. But when done right, I think it's the mark of a good band. And I wish more bands did them, really. Yeah, I mean, it was only really made in the Metallica that, I mean, Metallica speak for themselves. And then, I don't, you know, people think they're self indulgent is bollocks because if you've got, I mean, it works better for Metallica because you haven't got a spare member. Whereas, mm. like you just said, Paul Yarn, I've got a chance to have a fag or have a shit or whatever. But in a, in a four piece with Metallica where James can play guitar, they work so well because all the four members are, are still on stage and occupied. Yeah, that's one of the criticisms about later day Maiden when they do longer songs because Dickinson will fuck off. Yeah, you can't blame. He's probably going to rest his voice or have a drink or whatever or have a piss. But it it keeps the those instrumentals do tend to keep all the the musician members of the band occupied. Yeah, I think um, Sepultura did a good one on um, Schizophrenia. There's an instrumental on that's pretty good. 
can't remember what it's called though. Never mind. But yeah. <laughs> yeah they, for me, they don't exist before beneath the remains, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> I'll, I won't be seeing them again unless they do um, morbid. I always morbid. get morbid visions and morbid tales mixed up. Uh, it's morbid, morbid visions, morbid isn't visions. it? Yeah. Morbid tales is Celtic Frost. Yeah, morbid and, visions. Um, as, as a side note, uh, when I first heard Sepultura, I heard Slave New World, and I was like, fucking hell, this is awesome. And I went out and bought their back catalogue, and I thought, right, I'll start at the beginning. And of course, morbid visions <laughs> is the first thing you hear, and it was like, what the fuck is this? It was, oh, it, it, almost, it almost ruined me. <laughs> You look in the inlay carnival, got the black metal makeup on. <laughs> oh, yeah, fucking hell. But, uh, yeah, fair play to them. Uh, yeah, uh, one, two things I just want to say, actually, before I forget. Um, I think everyone does great on this album, but I think Dennis Strat- uh, Stratton's uh, input, I think, is actually understated. Um, of course, getting Adrian Smith in the band was... Well, of course, it was a good move. It obviously worked out. Um, but I do think he contributed. He was the right man for this album. Yeah, um, he, he contributed to the dynamics of it, I think, because yeah, there's he, a quite he, Rod he Small added a lot of harmony, a lot yeah, of melody. They were a four piece, remember, on the Soundhouse tapes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. That's another reason why it don't sound, you know, it sounds yeah, a bit I mean, spacey in places. I think there's a quote um, from Rod Smallwood where he said that, you know, that's why they got rid of Dennis because Dennis was into Queen and didn't want to go, you know, down that road. But it showed, like you say, it, it, he adds that to this album. Those those dynamics and those harmonies and those lighter moments, they really do stand out. And like Steve Harris says on DVD, he goes like, you know, he's a lovely bloke. This time it was musical differences. He li- yeah. he he did want genuinely want to go in a different direction, and he's gone on to do up do well as well. He's done a bunch of other bands. I think he's in. Um, is it top? Is it Prime Mantis or Tigers of Pantang? He may have done both. Probably. He's, he's a bit of a, they're all, they're um, all inbred, aren't they? He's you know, a bit of a hired gun, yeah. And um, he did do a tour, actually, Dennis Stratton, The Maiden Years, where he did the first album in full. And I, I did want to go to that, actually, in Kim's sign. I never got round to it, obviously. <laughs> but um, And also, just going to put it out there, you might argue with me, but... Strictly from a bass playing point of view, I think this is Steve Harris's. Is it the? I think he's well. I'll, I'll I'll be diplomatic and say one of his best performances because his oh, bass yeah. is all uh, he's all over that fretboard, and I think Alex Webster from Cannibal Corpse would have a very good time in another dimension where they do decide to re-record this album and Steve Harris breaks his arm. <laughs> And Alex Webster's gets hired to do it. He would have a fantastic time recording the bass. Yeah, I know. There's there's a reason that Harris is at the top of the best bass player polls year in and year out. Yeah, you know, he ain't just the fact he's a great songwriter. He he's the fucking, you know, for me, he's up there with Cliff Burton. You know, as one of the finest ever purveyors of the instrument, because he and he plays it. He he's got such a unique style. He's practically lead bass. I mean, they had three yeah. guitars long before three guitars on on Brave New World. You yeah. know, it, it, the bass was like like Burton was in Metallica. It's a, it's another instrument, and it ain't just in the background beefing up the root notes. They're fucking playing riffs of their own, mm. and the guitars are playing root notes around the bass playing sometimes. And it's he's one of the purveyors of that style. You know, a, a fantastic player. And yeah, I agree. He's some of the performances on this album are, are, are phenomenal. Right, so we're on to Strange World now. Sort of the little brother to Remember Tomorrow, I suppose. It doesn't quite have the same... Remember Tomorrow kind of builds up and then kind of has this break the old bam, 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 you know, and then it comes into its little... Dun, 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 you know, later on, and it all kind of builds up and goes into a thing, but Strange World does kind of just float along doesn't it i still like it i still think it's yeah. a fantastic song but j- just matching the two up and it yeah, does like, it's, it's, it does kind of just float doesn't it rather than yeah i mean i, I alluded to it earlier night and you said like we remember tomorrow and um if there was anything that needed to go if we had to have lots of got the nine tracks if you only need to have eight this would have gone for me because it's you know it's it's, it's filler but it's, it's well played filler. You can't argue the musicianship on it. And it's like you say, there's some beautiful, beautiful music on there. 
Fantastic but, um, leads. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right, worthy of Finn Lizzy. Yeah. And uh, it's just a case of, um, I mean, it, it, it was actually dropped from the sound house tapes because they didn't like the way it came out recorded. Yes, that's right. Was uh, well done for pointing that out. I forgot it. Um, did it ever resurface though? Possibly on one of the other, you know, official certificate of authenticity versions. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether the, you know, the official recordings ever been ever seen the light of day. Really, it must if, be. If Harris, if Harris didn't like it, then I don't know. know. It, it might be. Um, I've got pretty. I've got a bit of a treasure trove back here, yeah. so I'll have to have a look for it. But I didn't realise that until I read it earlier this week. So. Um, Pretty good. Funnily enough, a few years ago, uh, Paul Diano did the whole tour with uh, playing the album in full. Yeah. So that must have been the first time that out that track was played live um, yeah. since he was in the band. So uh, yeah, moving on, Charlotte the Harlot. Yeah. Again, a great. It's a good. It's a good time rocker. As soon as I hear that, dun, 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 you know that opening riff yeah. again. I'm just in a good mood. Yeah, it's a, a rare Dave Murray soul composition. Quite often, it? Yeah, he wrote it yeah. himself. You, you might, you, you know, he always he tries to get a song on each album, and it, but it's always in conjunction with Harris or Smith or Dickinson. He's never gone balls out on his own. But this was Murray Bosch, and it's um, yeah. it's it, it's a great song. It's our first introduction to Charlotte, who would who would appear twice uh, in two more songs, a little story, and. It's as catchy as the crabs you probably would have caught off of her if you'd ever paid her a visit. <laughs> there's, I'll have to, um, I'll come to this when I'll have to have a look into it, and I'll go into it again. But I think she's mentioned in another song as well. But it's, uh, 20, it's, well, it's twenty-two Acacia Avenue is is uh, then is from here Hooks to eternity. You. Oh fuck! I forgot from here to eternity. Hooks in you before that. Right, that's it. Yeah. Now, I think Hooks in you is definitely Charlotte. But from here to eternity, it's debatable. Yeah, it just says the Beast and Charlotte, they were two of a kind, didn't it? Yeah. It might have been talking about a bike. And she's basically on the back of his bike and they go yeah. away together and it's kind of like, well, that's sort of like a happy ending for Charlotte. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, I've, I've forgotten about that. She said, finally yeah. finds love, bless her. Yeah, after uh, giving everyone STDs and having hooks put in her. She's, just, she's the know. hooker with a heart of gold, mate. That's, Shit, that's... yeah. <laughs> Because it, it's quite funny because it's kind of like a rock and obviously it's a fun rock and roll song about a prostitute, you know, and it's yeah. a bit of a piss. There's also, there's also but a moral then it breaks down. down. Yeah, but then, yeah. then it, it kind of breaks down into this sort of heartbreaking. Yeah, the like mellows. he falls in love with her a little bit, but yes. she kind of, you know, he falls, he kind of falls for her a little bit, and then she kind of goes right, yeah, out next, yeah. and he's I'm kind of left there like a bit gutted. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I think um, there is a bit of a uh, an understatement. I do think men are the more romantic of the sexes. <laughs> I do think we uh, fall a bit quicker, quicker than we like to admit as well. So you're opening yourself up some grief in the comments, boy. <laughs> but yeah, well, you know, look, he, I think Paul had his heart broken at some point. Is all? Oh yeah, big time. He's so, yeah. There's a couple of songs I think you could you could uh, point that out. In. But yeah, another. Another great song. I mean, it's it's kind of known. Again, I'm talking about the lyrics, but they're talking about the music as well. It's it's kind of known as this sort of straight ahead rocker, but no, there's this you know big sort of yeah. ballad. Yeah, mellow in the section in there. Yeah, it's um, like I say again, Maiden throwing out, putting out all the stops, just announcing that they're here and they're taking no prisoners for me. You know, they are like nothing that came before. I've said it before. I say it again. They were unique. They are unique. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, so we're reaching the end. The uh, Iron Maiden. Um, I remember a Kerrang article where there was like down the side of the pages, it had different celebrities. So Dave Ellison, you know, name your favourite songs. So it's got Jamie Jester from Hate, but you know, the who's yeah. who of all metal. What's Scott Ian? what's your favourite Iron Maiden song? And when it came to Kerry King, it was Iron Maiden. And I thought, that's a really good choice for a favourite song. Because you're, Kerry King is never going to be disappointed when he goes to see him live. That's it, yeah. <laughs> that's it. It's always played, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I do think that opening riff, that... Da, na, 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 I do think that is a prototype Slayer riff. I'll yeah. put that out there. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like fresh, really. It is, because it's fast. It's, um, actually, I've, I've got a gripe with the studio version of this. I don't know the way Clive plays it. I prefer the way Nico plays it. Because Clive, where it, Clive plays it, he starts off doing the, but then when the chorus kicks in, he changes and starts doing six thinks and it goes to a sort of a semi-normal beat. Whereas live, Nico will carry on doing it double time all the way through and it helps the, helps the flow of the song. It's just balls to the wall all the way yeah. through. Uh, it is a lot faster live. Um, it, of course, there's countless live versions of it. You could bloody sit there comparing them all day. But there's a um, there's a part as well. I'm just trying to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that final breakdown, uh, Steve's bass. Nico does that faster. He literally does a machine, like a machine gun. You know? He he just... It's so fast. And yeah, he's a bit... And then that's it. With that being said, though, I do do love Clive Burr as a drummer. I do think he... The his best is yet to come. I think Killers or maybe um, Number of the Beasts is probably his better performance. Yeah, but. I've got a I've got a, a love hate relationship with Clive Burr. This is there's no doubt in he could play the fuck out of that kit. No doubt in that. You know he was he was a fabulous drummer. He's the the speed that he he got his arms going with his cymbal work was phenomenal. But I hated his parts. Mm. I never liked what he wrote ever. It was undoubted his talent and he could play the drums, but I didn't like the way he wrote. And I fell in love. I've got more appreciation for the songs off the first three albums when Nico plays them. Because Nico obviously didn't try and copy what Clive did. He, no, he did didn't. Stand no. And he, he said, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, it's not how I work. I'm not going to copy what's gone before. I'm going to use it as a basis because I'm going to honour it, but I'm going to put my own stamp on it. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say I, I never, think I, it's, I never yeah, loved the, the way Clive wrote ever. I'm not disagreeing with you. I just think when you play a song as faithful as you are to the original, once you've played it, I mean, how many times has Nico played Iron Maiden? Hundreds. Yeah, exactly. Or Run to the Hill. Or Number of the Beast or even, um, oh, for fuck's sake, Hello, Be My Name. Yeah. Whatever that, you know, any of those songs, once you've played them 500 times, you're inevitably going to do yeah. something different. You just are, yeah. you know. So I think I think it's maybe come out, come with time. I reckon he probably stuck to it to begin with, and then just just over yeah, time, it'd be, it's just it'd be interesting up. to watch some gigs from the Peace of Mind tour from the World Peace yeah. tour, and uh, yeah. see what uh, see Harry Harry did them because obviously they were fresh songs still. I wonder if there is a live album or a. I mean, obviously, Live After Death was the first proper live album, but there must be some recordings. Yeah, I in think it is. Like a gig, gig in Germany. I think it's on the early days. Yeah. Full gig, I mean, though. But, yeah, to be continued, we'll, we'll yeah, look into that. There's got to be something. But, um, so, yeah. So, that's the first album. Um, what Your final thoughts, your conclusion, and your score at the end? Yeah, I mean, it's a classic. It's iconic. It, without that, metal ain't fucking metal. I don't give a shit what anyone says. You know, you can argue that Metallica are a greater band than Maiden and all the rest of it, but without Maiden, metal is not what it is now. You know, like, yeah, Sabbath made it, they invented the genre, but they they were old and tired by the time Maiden come around. And Maiden just took the ball and they run with it. And they've never dropped it for me. Even people, people can go, oh, fucking blowing Bailey, all that shit, but we'll get to that. But yeah. they've been going strong for 40 years and they've been driven by one man, and that's Steve Harris. You know? Yeah. He is, oh, fuck it, the guy's unbelievable, you know, and he will go down as one of, you know, the all-time greatest musicians for, not, not playing ability, because playing ability, yeah, he's a great musician, but he'll go down as one, or he should go down as one of the all-time greatest driving forces. You know, all these fucking bands, that are different genres and all the rest of it, how many of them have had 40 years solid success, selling out arenas? And, and even at their low course, point. Even at a low point, they were yeah. still they were still, you know, yeah. fairly on top. I mean, exactly. when they were playing Brick, Bricks and Academy, that was still one of the biggest venues that yeah. a metal band would play. But that was only over here. You got to South America. This fucking it's still it's still doing twenty thousand seaters. Yeah, you know, forty Brazil. years, forty years constant. I mean, the Stones, yeah, they've been around that time, 
but they have peaks and troughs. They'll they'll do an album and they'll tour it for perhaps a year, then they'll fucking disappear because they need to recharge. So they they live, up for a few years as well. well a lot of people you know, forget that. Yeah. Same with Sabbath. They've had these different lineup. Ch- I mean, not saying they've never had lineup changes, but they have these peaks and troughs where they disappear because they're no longer relevant or they're no longer got the drive. But Maiden have been there. And they're going to go for another 10 years. They'll go till, till Nico dies, I think, because they're all still, whenever you hear them, they're all got the fire. And it's, it's Steve Harris, mate. He's a fucking, he's, he's infectious with his desire to keep going. I, I don't, long may it rain. Yeah. I don't really want to contemplate it, to be honest. No, and I'd rather, yeah. Be like, I think if Nico steps down, they will carry on. With Nico's blessing, I think if they if they yeah. included him in the selection of a new drummer, and he yeah. was happy to pass, oh, he, he picked his, he picked the, yeah. Then I think that would be they'd, they'd carry on for a few years then. But I'll, but yeah, if, if the worst happens, then yeah. maybe they would probably go nah. But yeah, that's not something I wouldn't even want to yeah. contemplate. So yeah, anyway, I, I got off the point. Obviously, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> like, it's fucking it's, it's you can do it, mate. You just disappear down the rabbit hole. But it's an iconic album, and like I say, you know, production wise. It's, it's a bit of a shit, but it, it sounds like it sounds, you know. It, would I like it to be reproduced? Yeah, but I'd probably hate it, probably just, just to spite myself, because it doesn't sound like the Maiden album. But for me, you know, it's an eight, it's an eight or a nine, you know, strange roll aside, uh, that stops it from being a 10 for me, but it, it's an eight or a nine, and it's it's an all time classic. Um, to, to me, it's a 10. Um, I, 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 up and they pretty much do a winning streak. Um, they come straight out of the gate. A few a few bits fall off due to the velocity of the speed, but they just replace the part and carry on. I mean, what would we have? Like a four album run where it's not the same album, uh, same al- same lineup. Same lineup. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't the same lineup it until Power Slave. Yeah, it wasn't until Power Slave that they recorded yeah. with the same lineup twice, wasn't it? But sure. um, but th- this has got all the energy, all the fucking balls, all the urgency the the hunger and the naivety really that that youthful ballsy don't give a fuckness that you want from a debut album the 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 debut album is a band coming out and when i say like throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks it's not quite that but they they're throwing everything out there because this is their only chance in their heads this could be it we are gonna it's the bird jumping out the nest. I'm either going to fly or I'm going to fall. Yeah. So I'm going to give it everything I've got. And they do, literally. We've got some slow... We've got fast, punky songs. We've got complicated metal songs. We've got this song. We've got, we've got like a slow, epic song. We've got a proggy song. We've, like, they literally just throw everything at you. Just, this is what we're capable of. We have got something to say. Yeah. And there is, a, there is that... There's a certain thing on a really good debut album that you can feel that. And um, I think Kill 'em All's one of them. Yeah. I think the first Angel Witch album actually has that. Um, well, I could, I could go on, really. Yeah, go on, yeah, you know, I mean. but there, there's a certain... And I think as well, it's, it's really good to, to examine a debut album of a band that did go on to do great things. I mean, if you ever sit down and just listen to Queen's first album, like that, that first album, so you fuck what comes later, just blank all out of your mind, just go... This is these like eight songs that this band came up with. Then you know it's it's great to just sort of yeah. zoom in on it and wow, that, that's a hint of that you know. So yeah, I mean this this album's really dear to my heart. Um, again, it, it's not it's it's the Eddie on the front cover, but it's also the background of the houses because there's those streets of London. Yeah. It reminds me of Grey's, um, <laughs> where we're from. To viewers that uh, don't know otherwise. But it is, it's those English streets, isn't it? It's that dark Friday night, raining. Yeah. You're going to go to a pissy, sticky floor venue and watch a metal band. It's just, it just conjures all that up for me. And um, again, I, I kind of think of this era as a separate band. I see this as a band that's split up in a way, because it kind of is. Yeah, yeah. Two you've original got members two now. albums, you? You've got two albums in there. And, yeah, and, 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 I'm not saying this was a better era, but there is a lot of stuff that the band moved on and left behind. So there's this, there's this, this nice little capsule in this certain time of the band, which is something that I'm 
looking forward to examining further on the next episode, but then moving on to further episodes. So, yeah, I think that concludes the first episode. And, um, yeah, I think it's safe to say, me and Luke, Iron Maiden are the greatest band ever. So yeah. I'm looking forward to this series. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And um, we're going to be working on, you know, I'm going to try and sort out sort of different audio settings, different visual settings and play with it until we find our feet. So bear with us for the first two or three until we find our groove. But thanks for watching, everyone. And um, we'll see you next week for Killers. Peace out. Metal forever. Take care, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye.